Next up, Wolfgang Gehring and his journey to Inner Source. Take it away. Thanks very much. Hi, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for joining my session on which we will, I will take you on a journey to Inner Source. So, uh, oops, what is Inner Source? Well, so there are many definitions. This one is a very short one, and I like it because it's very concise and, and gets to the point. So inner source is like open source, except everything stays in the company. Okay, makes sense, yeah? Um, let me give you another approach to inner source, and this will take a couple of minutes, so uh, I ask for a bit of your patience. So uh, my mother, she knows I work for Mercedes-Benz, and she also knows... Uh, that as an IT guy, I don't actually build cars. So the other day, not too long ago, she asked me, what is it that you actually do at Mercedes? And so I tell her about software development and uh, open source and sharing and inner source and, and that kind of thing. And so she listens. You know, she's like, okay, she nods. And after a while she goes, yeah, that makes sense. That it, it has been predestined for you. I'm like, what do you mean? And she says, you want to go for a walk? I'm like, okay. So every time I visit my parents, my mother and I like to go on extended walks, you know, and we just chew the fat. And um, so she's like, let's go. So um, you have to know that I come from this small city called Mülheim an der Donau, which is in the very south of Germany, about two hours south of Stuttgart, uh, close to the lake of Constance. And it's a city of three and a half thousand people which um, I realize I'm in Berlin, and uh, that sounds a bit funny, huh? Uh, a settlement, to call a settlement of three and a half thousand people a city, but it actually is, it has been a city for almost a thousand years. And it's actually quite nice. So, so this is uh, the city gate entrance, and there are a lot of uh, timber framed houses, and uh, it has a castle, and this is the Baron's family still lives in that castle. I mean, that's their house, yeah? Um, and it sits at the very beginning of the uh, upper Danube Valley, which is a natural park. It's really beautiful. You know, here is the Danube. The Danube is only about 45 minutes old, so it's really small still, and it has a lot of rocks and forests, so it's really pretty. And so my mom and I walk, and so my parents' house is somewhere around here, and here is uh, the so-called Wulfbach Quelle, Wulfbach Quelle Höhle. So this is a very small stream and it comes out of the mountain there and then only about uh, two kilometers further down, it flows into the Danube, okay? And I used to go there a lot as a kid because it's really, it's really neat. So, so it looks like this, you know, this is a very small stream here and the, the water just kind of comes out of the mountain there. And the reason why this is so fascinating is because this actually it doesn't look like much, but it is the entrance to the second largest cave system of the Swabian Jura, the Schwäbische Alb. So it extends for kilometers and kilometers inside and has been researched still uh, to this day. And so, you know, when I stood there as a kid, I was like, I really wonder what it looks like inside. I want to go there. And one day I stood there and two cave divers came out of that hole. And, you know, they looked like astronauts to me. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, I want to do this one day. When I'm grown up, I'm going to go cave diving. Okay. So um, now that has never happened. Well, not here anyway. I have become a professional diver. So very arduous diver. And for a while, I, I worked in the dive industry. And I have dived caves, but not like this. This is way more advanced than, than what I can do. Okay? And it's also dangerous, of course. And you're not allowed to go inside because it's, you know, there's a police order uh, that says you know, only with a special permit. Okay. Um, so my mom and I arrive there. And uh, she points to it. And she says, there you go. Like, I, okay, I, I don't get it. What do you mean? And she says, well, I always knew you were going to get into this line of work. Just look at it. I mean, this is where the water comes out of the mountain. This is the river's source. And obviously, it's open. Duh. So, I was like, Okay. Moms know, I guess, right? I was like, okay, I, I didn't make that connection. 
Fine. Okay, so she knew. Um, now, when you go inside, just like down here, this is kind of what it looks like inside. This is not a real picture. I guess you can see that it's AI generated. There's, I only know one picture of what it actually looks like, a, a real picture, but uh, it's copyrighted and I couldn't use it. But it's very similar to this. So this here is uh, the river inside and it flows out here. And so this, ladies and gentlemen, this is the river's inner source. And it's also a really nice example of how inner source can lead to open source. Okay, so a lot of companies say, well, we don't know open source, everybody can see our code, I don't know. You can practice first in inner source, and then when you feel comfortable, then you can open source it, okay? So here, there you go. And um, one more thing, uh, in contrast, this here is the so-called Blautopf, which is near Blaubeuren, which is near Ulm. Next time you go there, Taurus, go visit. Yeah, um, This looks like a little lake, and it, and it is, but it's also, again, the entrance to another cave system, in fact, to the largest cave system on the Swabian Jura that extends, I think, over 11, 12 kilometers have been researched so far. But it's much more difficult even to get into this one because you first have to go into this lake and then down, and then there's a little hole, and then you can go inside, but it's really complicated. And it requires a lot of effort, a lot of gear. It's like people have actually had accidents there, and, and so it's, it's much more dangerous. So this is an example of closed source. Right? And you can see it's, it makes things a lot more complicated in some respects. Okay, so now let us dive into the whole thing a bit deeper and uh, tap into our inner source. All right, so um, when we started our inner source journey at Mercedes-Benz um, Enterprise IT, it's about seven years ago or so, we mainly had three challenges. So the first one was tooling. And then the other ones, uh, legal, governance, and cultural change. All right, so let's look at tooling first. So we didn't have the prerequisites that we needed to do inner source because everybody was on their own platform. You know, somebody, uh, some teams were on GitLab, GitHub, then the others were in GitLab, uh, Bitbucket Stash, TFS, SVG, you name it. Big company, every system uh, was used. So that doesn't make inner source impossible, but it, sh it certainly makes it more complicated. So what you want to do if you're at the beginning of your inner source journey, uh, you want to think about making one platform where the majority of people are on. So it's just much easier to exchange code. Okay, so we had, um, we got a group together and talked about which platform should it be. And we evaluated two day workshop and then it came, it came up with 50% said GitHub and 50% said GitLab. <laughs> Okay, so we decided it was a GitHub for enterprise IT. Uh, vehicle IT, uh, they decided that they're going with GitLab mostly. Okay, so it's good to have one uh, code platform, or maybe two, okay? Um, that, that still works, that's, that's fine, but, some, but not 20, okay? So that's one thing, that's the prerequisite. You want to make it easy for people to exchange code, right? So that's why the one platform. Another thing is you want maybe to use and install tools that help uh, the spreading of open source and inner source. And here, this is a picture of the inner source discovery portal that, is, uh, made, that was created by SAP and we have adopted it at Mercedes internally as well. So that just is a nice uh, tool that makes it a bit easier to find things and you can uh, customize it and so forth. So that's just a recommendation. I think it's kind of nice. Tooling, and then there are other tools as well, but let's leave it at it for now. So the second thing we were facing, the second problem was uh, legal topics. Because so the thing is, um, so one entity of the big company that is Mercedes-Benz developed software for a product owner that was somewhere here in the company, and then another team developed software for a product owner that was here in the company. And they were actually not allowed to exchange code because these product owners, they had the exclusive right to that code. And so even with your neighboring team, you couldn't exchange code, which is really kind of stupid because we're all in the same company, right? But just the contracts that were in place wouldn't allow it. 
So we had to first fix that problem. Now that's a topic that's especially probably prevalent in big companies, uh, big corporations that have lots of legal entities. But it could also be, let's say you're a software developing company and you have different customers. They probably have also the exclusive right to the code that you develop with their money. So that might be an issue as well. Just saying, you have to be careful when you exchange code that you don't get into uh, problems there. Okay, so fix contracts if necessary. Um, another topic, inner source license. Everybody knows open source licenses. Do we need an inner source license? We discussed that for a long time, and then we came to the conclusion, yes, we should have an inner source license. And then our um, lawyers crafted an inner source license that was several pages long, and everyone was like, oh, come on, we wanted MIT-type license. Just to, Why does it have to be pages and pages? Okay, because um, when you're in a big company that has lots of legal entities, you need to talk about what happens when one entity leaves the big corporation. Do they still, are they still allowed to use the code that they took? Uh, are they, can they still contribute? Can, you know, all these things. And so you just need to find a regulation that, that talks about that. That's why, especially if you're a big company, you need uh, an inner source license, I would say. Okay? So, next thing, governance, code of conduct. Do you need a code of conduct in inner source? Usually, not really, because everybody has work contracts, and usually in the work contracts, there is a passage that somewhere says, you know, be nice to each other, behave okay, and so forth. So you don't need it, really, but it also doesn't hurt. Okay, so we have a uh, code of conduct for inner source. I mean, here it says, I think it says, uh, in FOSS, so FOSS community is open source, okay, but it's still also used just like that in inner source. Contribution guidelines, that's something I strongly recommend you have because if you want other uh, projects and people to contribute to your code, you need to lower the barrier as much as you can. And you know, if, you, if they just find the code, then they will probably be very confused, how do I install this, how do I develop, how do I build the product and so forth. So contribution guidelines explain exactly what you can do, what you have to do in order for, for someone to contribute. Okay? Contribution guidelines. This is an example, I mean this is obviously just the very beginning, but this is an example from one of our inner source products, projects. Okay, now tax. You've heard of uh, tax being an issue with uh, inner source? Have you? Some of you, maybe? Yeah, thanks. So uh, that was something that puzzled us for a long time. First of all, it wasn't clear why tax is an issue, but it again is an issue if you have companies in many countries. And if you exchange code, you know, sometimes maybe there needs to be taxes involved. Okay, so we thought about this, and we have then come up with an initial tax self-assessment. So when you open something for inner source, you will get an issue into your repository that says, please consider several factors. One is security, passwords, and so forth. And one part is the tax issue. Okay, so the tax self-assessment provides guidance on whether certain requirements are met and you can share the code free of charge. Um, this goes to the, the, the so-called uh, arms length principle. Free of charge means would you hypothetically agree to share the code freely with third parties in open source? Okay. So it's important to say this is an initial assessment, whether this is acceptable or not. The tax people will still take a look more closely. Okay. And so here, uh, what are the questions? I'm going to share it with you. I have to remark, this is not legal advice because I'm not a lawyer. Okay. So this is just uh, my take on it. So here are the initial criteria and uh, the orientation questions for the tax self-assessment. First, do you expect to receive contributions? Background, the idea of sharing something you know, and getting back so much more. Okay. A second, explain why and how it is possible that others are capable of contributing to your project. For example, through bug fixes, patches, and so forth. Okay, because if it's not possible, then obviously question number one is uh, probably violated. 
And then if no Mercedes-Benz specific specifics were included in the code and you wouldn't have to invest a lot of time to adapt the code, would you hypothetically agree to share it with the general open source community? And you have to answer yes to all of these questions. If no, uh, then you cannot make it inner source. Okay? Um, short explanation has to be provided and documented, and then later the, the tax people will look at it. Okay? Um, we have never published this before. This is the first time. Um, and we don't actually know very many or any examples of how other companies do it. So we would be very interested. If you have a solution for your tax and transfer pricing uh, topic, then uh, please share it with us, with the community. Approach me or just you know, give a talk maybe or publish it on your website because that would be very interesting. Okay? For all of us in the community, this is also sharing and getting something back. All right? So, second problem. And now the third one, the cultural change. Um, yeah, that's possibly even the most difficult one because it's very, uh, it can be very time consuming. So, we have the Mercedes Benz, <laughs> Mercedes -Benz FOSS manifesto. <laughs> and um, um, I have talked about the manifesto before in presentations, so I'm not going to go into much detail, but it's, so it's a, an open proclamation of how open source is important for us and for the company, and that we believe in open source, and we want you as our engineers to participate. Okay? And so it doesn't allow people to do open source, it actually sends them on that mission. All right? Please go out there, be active in open and inner source. And I have, so th this is the, these are the company principles, and I have highlighted the first two because they have a connection to inner source. So it says, uh, please, you know, be active in inner source. And the second one, you can do this on company time, of course, right? It's not your free time. You do it for work, obviously it's working time. That's important to emphasize because, you know, way back when, uh, people would contribute to open source projects in their free time. And that's not the idea behind it. Okay, and there are also laws against that, by the way. So uh, here are the, the uh, employee principles, and they, that say, before you write custom code of your own, please look if there's something available in open source. And if not, is there something available in inner source? And only if that's a no, then you can think about writing custom code or uh, buying code, okay? And then second also here, please be active in inner source, contribute to inner source, okay? Uh, you can find the FOSS manifesto here on our open source landing page, open source mercedesbenz.com, and then on the top right corner there's a link to the manifesto. You can take a closer look. So that's one cultural thing. The company has to learn, hey, we want to be active and embrace FOSS with all its uh, aspects. But another thing is when you talk to people and say, have you thought about open sourcing this? Have you thought about inner sourcing this? They say, well, yes, we want to, but it's not finished yet. Well, it doesn't have to be finished. You can put it into the open or inner source domain at any stage in the life cycle of the product. Even if you just have an idea and you don't have any code yet, you can just put the idea out there and say, hey, I have this idea. What do you people think? Let's work on this. Or you already have a prototype and say, hey, here's a prototype of my idea. What do you think? Should we do carry this further? Uh, development. You're in the development phase. It's not finished yet. It doesn't have to be. You can still open source it. Or when it's finished and you're in the maintenance phase, also fine. Yeah, but so far, most people think it has to be done before I can open source it. It's not the case. And same with inner source. Okay? Um, now, now we have all the foundations and uh, now is inner source happening and we have this one project it's a knight in shining armor and it's uh, called i3 and it's an infrastructure project they received more than 100 contributions in a year 1200 members in the mattermost community so yay inner source okay so this is working really nice and then we have another couple of projects that have similar uh, contributions but uh, then there's vastness and nothingness yeah so why why is inner source staying behind its expectations? So we looked into this, and uh, first of all, a few thoughts here is um, 
why isn't inner source as successful as open source? Well, because you know, open source projects are created for sharing from the very beginning. Most inner source projects are not. They're usually very specified, specific customer needs. So there's, it's not realistic to expect a lot of contributions there. Um, only 2% of all open source projects are even considered successful. Yeah, what does successful even mean? And probably one quarter of that taking the vast share, okay? This is just an estimate, by the way, and uh, keep in mind that about 63.5% of all statistics are made up anyway, you know, sometimes even on the fly. And uh, so why should you expect that inner source is more, uh, is more successful than 2%? Yeah? So this is you know, realistic, be realistic. And then another thing is, if you do inner source right, it requires a lot of additional effort. You have to adapt the code make it read more readable. You have to adapt the documentation and add documentation, which, by the way, is one of the big benefits of inner source. If you do it right, it increases the overall quality. Okay, so that's good in itself. Then there are legal liability concerns, you know, but what if somebody uses it and then something goes wrong with my code? Do I have to take the responsibility? Okay, people are afraid. So nah, maybe not open source it or inner source it. You have to make advertisement, community management, other, so people even find out about your code. Yeah? And then people usually don't have time because everybody's swamped with work these days. Right? So if you want to contribute to the code over there, you know, it's like, ah, oh, where does the time come from? All right? And then open source solution can sometimes be found easier than taking something in inner source and adapting it which is actually perfectly fine, right? Yeah, you open source. Um, so here are big stumbling blocks that we found. Time and availability of the engineers. Everybody's too busy. I have to keep my deadline. I can't help this guy over there with his. Yeah. Um, I, oh, and the numbers, of course, middle management has numbers. Yeah, we all know inner source is good, but I have my numbers here, and I can't have half of my engineers contributing to something completely else. Yeah? OK, so these are all problems. What do you do? Well, if you want to look for successful, potentially successful inner source projects, um, I think they have these correct characteristics. So they need to solve a common and widespread developer pain or demand. Like this i3 inner source project that I uh, just mentioned, it's an infrastructure project. Everybody needs it. So that's why it has a big community. Okay? But if it's very specialized, don't expect a big community. Um, it has to have company specifics in it, because if it's not, then it could be open source. Okay? And the project needs to have one or two or more dedicated maintainers. Same with open source. You know, If you put it out there uh, and nobody takes care of it, then it will just go there to die. And the same is true with inner source. A lot of times people say, hey, I just put it in inner source and then somebody else will take care of it. It's not happening, right? Uh, and you need community management because, again, you know, they, not everybody will find out about it automatically. So that's very important. So, um, as a side note, it's perfectly okay to open an inner source repository and not expect contributions because others can take a look and learn. That's perfectly fine. Um, but then, you know, don't complain. I'm not getting any contributions. Well, if you're not making it fit for inner source, you will not, you will not get any contributions. Okay, very hard to measure. Did somebody learn from it? I don't know, if they don't tell me, I don't know, but it's fine, okay? So key takeaways, if you're at the beginning of your inner source journey, I recommend you make the company fit for inner source. You know, what I said with the uh, uh, three topics and uh, try to remove the stumbling blocks talk a lot again and again. That's very important inside the company. Um, and don't assume it will all happen by itself. You can have an ISPO, Inner Source Program Office, or you can have an ISPO part of your OSPO, which is what we do, which is perfectly fine, whatever works for you. Okay, so thank you, and may there always be wind in your hair. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, what a, great, what a great journey that was. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Yep. Uh, 
Hi, thank you. Uh, can you talk a little about the community management efforts you do at uh, Mercedes about InnoSource? Yeah, so um, we we tell our projects you need inner source, uh, you need community management, um, and some projects start doing this. You know, at first we said we can help you maybe at the very beginning. We'll tell you what community management is, and then you have to go from there. And then actually we we saw for a bit that they weren't doing it. Some were, some weren't, you know, because they kind of expected us to do it for them, but we also don't have the capacity to do that. So we, we enable them by giving them lectures or lessons how to do it, or here's a starting point, you know, this is how you create a community, and so forth, but you have to do it yourself. And that is more or less successful, right? Okay, thanks. Yeah. I would love to have commu more community managers that can do it for the projects, but that's also not realistic, unfortunately. Uh, there's a question there. So I don't know if you can talk about this, but I was curious, do you have like a rough ratio of how many of your projects are inner source directed versus open source? Because usually companies are all in on inner source or all in on open source, not necessarily both, uh, like you are. Can you talk a little bit about like the general ratio of inner source versus open source participation in your company? Um, not really, because I don't know the numbers. Fair what I, what I have what we have done is we have looked at how many repositories we have in total, how many of them are open for inner source. Um, so I have numbers on that, and it's actually, it's, it's quite a nice ratio, I think, but it was also, why is it only, I don't know, 20% or so, and then it's like, well, some are not fit for inner source and so forth and so forth, yeah. Uh, I don't have the absolute numbers in my head, to be honest, and then open source, we don't have very many open source projects yet. We have a number, like you can see them on our landing page as well, um, but we want to get more in the future for this, yeah. Hi. Cool, cool questions. No? Thanks, Tom. I think that was it. Good, then thanks very much. Uh, I will be here the next couple of days. You'll see me if you have more questions. Thanks. <laughs>